Okay, I'm going to go ahead and keep an eye on the Twitch stream. I've got it minimized in my uh, corner of my screen, and I have Discord in the other corner. Perfect. So if any questions come up there. Okay. Sorry, I got distracted. I was uh, listening to the Twitch stream at the same time, and my voice kind of caught me by surprise. <laughs> that 10-second delay, you know. Hey, Berkey, welcome. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to give you guys the credentials to connect. I'm going to post it in room two in the text channel. For your username, I'd like you to use your Discord name, please. So you will click uh, join game, put your username in, which will be your Discord name. And I posted the alias or the host address in the text channel of Classroom 2. As soon as you guys connect, 
um, when you get the pop-up windows, please close those. We won't need them just yet. So you'll get a campaign setup window, and you'll also get a character selection window. Just close those for now. In the chat window, I'm going to use the vote function. So when you guys are ready to move on, you'll just click on the circle. OK. And now what I'm going to have you guys do is on the right corner of your screens, there is a dice tower. It looks like a rook from a chess game. Go ahead and right click on it, unlock it, and drag it over to where it's closer to the dice. That makes it a little easier for you guys when you want to drop dice into the tower. So with that said, grab the 20-sided dice on the far left of the dice pile and drop it right into the uh, dice tower. And then take the same dice and you can drop it in the chat window. There you go. All right. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but you can change the color of your dice. Obviously, you guys have done that, looks like. But if you're not sure or you don't remember, it's on the top right where it says colors. And it looks like one of those paint palettes that the French used to use back in the day when they were painting on the easel. Okay, next thing I want to do is help you guys set up your screen. Um, it's kind of what we're doing now. Um, if you're happy with your visibility, um, go ahead and check the box as I put the vote. Okay, you can rescale your screen, and the command is a right slash scale UI, it's all one phrase and then space and use any number between 85 and 95. It will shrink the screen a little bit, but you'll have a little bit more desktop space. And then when, if you end up doing that, you'll have to minimize and re-maximize the screen and that'll straighten it back out. Unfortunately, it moves your dice tower, so you'll have to relocate that if you end up resizing your screen. And I'm assuming you both have PCs, is that correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. Sometimes these commands and things, I, I always assume that people have PCs, but that's not the right way to operate, so. All right. Um, next thing we're gonna do is activate the library. This is the first thing you want to do when you buy things from Smiteworks or Wizard of the Coast or Steam or wherever you get your stuff from, even the Dungeon Masters Guild, you want to have access to the books and the materials that you buy. So the first thing you do is you're going to activate the books in the library. In this session, I'm going to have you guys open up a series of books, and what happens is it'll bog your system down for like the first five or ten minutes, and that's normal. So when we open up the player's handbook, it will create a little bit of grief for you for a little bit, and then it'll, it'll eventually smooth itself out. Okay, so click on the library tab on the far, far right. It's a banner with a book on it. And what you'll see there is the library, and on the top, there's four sections there. 
as GM play create PC and all just momentarily I like to s click on all and you'll see all the banners show up to the right um, this is the mode that you would probably use if you were creating your own content or if you're running a game I just wanted you to be aware of all those um, for the tutorial that we're doing here I want you to click create PC And that should narrow it down for you guys, so it's not so confusing. Okay. Next thing we're going to do in the library window is on the bottom left, there's a modules button. Please click that. At the bottom of that window that just popped up, it's called the Data Module Activation Window. This is where you actually enable the stuff that you've purchased or that the DM is sharing with you guys. So what you want to do is type uh, Player's Handbook Deluxe in the box below. So it would be PH or DD PHB Deluxe. And it should have kind of a reddish cover. Go ahead and click load on that. You do not have to worry about the PHB customization pack. Now for probably 10, 15 minutes, it's going to act kind of weird. So don't get click happy and try to open and close windows during that time the book is downloading because you could crash your session. So just relax, let it download. You need to go get some water, whatever. Um, there's no indicator that shows when it's done, but you'll be able to tell because it won't lag as much on you. And once you actually get to a point where you can use your computer without it lagging too much, there's a few other things I want you guys to open and activate as well. So in the search window, where I had you actually search for the Player's Handbook Deluxe, I just want you to back up that search. So in other words, delete the search field. And you'll see a whole bunch of different uh, Rob2E products there. They're purple icons. Um, the main ones I want you to load are the effects coding. So it'd be like the 5e effects coding packages. Uh, these are something that I purchased online from the DMs Guild. Um, Rob Tui created these for the community, and there are other authors out there that create stuff similar to this, but uh, for this tutorial, I'm going to use the Rob Tui coding packages. And the main thing we're going to have for you to enable, depending on what you're building, is the 5e feats effects coding. That's one of the packages. So when you're able to, just click load on that one and then wait a few seconds and then we want to load the 5e class feature effects coding and if I'm going too fast just speak up it's not too fast by itself but uh, it's still loading the first one and uh, it's better to wait when it's done okay. I suppose yeah, that's fine. So I'm glad you spoke up because that's, you know, you're, you're kind of a ways away, so it's going to take a while to download the stuff. So while we're waiting, um, Berkey, how long have you been playing? I'm new. <laughs> oh, really? Mm -hmm. I've uh, participated in a couple of... Um just brief sessions, um, but I've never finished a campaign. Um, oh. I was in, yeah, I was invited to play with an existing group and they're using Fantasy Grounds, or they will be, so I wanted to get a, a jump start and get familiar with the program. And, Great. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I haven't developed any bad habits. <laughs> Great. Have you played uh, tabletop before? <clears throat> no. Um, no, I play a lot of uh, tabletop board games, but I haven't played any RPGs. 
Oh, okay. So you're almost totally new. Yeah, I mean, I played, um, you know, video games, uh, video game RPGs, but not right. tabletop. Right. Gotcha. How about you, Pluster? Mm, well, I'm also quite new. Uh, the D and D and so on. Uh, I watched uh, a lot of it during the last year, but uh, uh, well, played uh, exactly one game here. The training session. Uh, it happened. It so happened. It was convenient for me to play it, but uh, it's the actual first, if I'm not mistaken, character creation class that I'm able to participate in. So it's uh, a little bit weird uh, ordering for me. And generally, uh, that's it. Also experience with computer games, but uh, including D&D based, but uh, one session in D&D and that's it. Okay, so yeah. you're fairly new, kind of, too. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I guess you guys came to the right place to learn Fantasy Grounds. Um, hopefully your experience here will be good. Um, not too many casualties or problems. Um, Plesser, how's your um, load looking? Is it still kind of lagging? Uh, no, it seems it's uh, loaded. Oh, great. How about you, Burke? Yeah, everything seems to be going fine. Okay. I think I'm ready. Okay, so in the search field where I had you search for the DD PHB Deluxe, just delete the search criteria, and you'll notice all those purple icons. And there's about four or five of those I'm going to have you guys load for the training, because we're going to need these later on when we build your character. So I want you to make sure you load the five EFX coding, the feats one. I think you've already done that, maybe. And then there's also a 5E class features effects coding. Done. Okay. And then there's a 5E racial effects coding. It's actually 5E race trait effects coding is what it's called. And then there's a 5E spell effects coding. So it's uh, class feature, feats, race traits, and spell effects. Yep, and, and then there's it. a class features. Yes, I started with that. Okay. So there's 5e... Um... Class features, yep. feats effects, mm -hmm. race traits effects, and spell effects. That is correct. Okay. All right, so when you guys connect to a table for the first time, you're going to have to go through this pretty much every time. So what I'm what I mean by that is if it's a new table that you've never connected to before, you're going to have to go through a similar setup. So ideally, if you're going to play in a campaign, you want to connect with your dungeon master one at a time, work your character out and get that situated and then you won't have such a large load time when you actually sit down to play. And so this is part of the reason why we're doing the college because it's a real burden for a dungeon master to have to connect with five people and do this all at once. And so the ideal method would be to 
do one person at a time and do a session zero where all of you come together at once and work all the details out and then actually start a campaign afterwards. So that would be a more of an organized approach. If you just have people connecting to you left and right and then trying to do characters and run a game in one day, you're probably going to be looking at eight hours. So that's kind of why we do this uh, training so you guys can understand the dynamics of, of creating a character, but also understand that from the DM side, um, it's very easy for this to crash if you have too many people at once. Um, if too many people are opening books at the same time, it takes a lot longer to download the books. And there's so many different things that happen during the initial setup. So when you guys are doing this on your own at home, you should be fine. But when you guys try to connect to somebody else's table, you'll have to go through this setup process that we're going through now. So that's just kind of important to know this stuff and to expect this every time you connect to a new table. Now, if it's a table that you've been connected to another host for a long time, you won't have as much of this. So is there any questions on that stuff? Nope. Okay. Another thing is you'll have access to the books that I've shared with you or the materials um, while we're connected. But when we disconnect and we're no longer um, doing character creation, you will not have access to any of the books that I've shared now. So that, that kind of goes away. It's severed. The only way that would happen is if you owned your own copy on your side of it. And you would probably want to get a standard license, which is around $40 American. And then maybe get the player's handbook. That's pretty much all you would need in the start. I have an ultimate license right now. So nice. uh, I created a few characters, but uh, it seems quite a bit weird. Uh, not everything, even from basic present, but for basic creation, it's absolutely okay. Oh, I was told I played one game and I was able to create some kind of character for okay. that game. So this might be more of a refresher, but it might also be a little bit more formal for you too. Yes, also, yes. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, that was first level character, and uh, I right now have no idea if I could correctly to do all those uh, level ups and so on. So it would be very useful for me anyway. Uh, Berkey, were you going to say something? Uh uh. Okay. Nope, no, it was me. <laughs> What's up, Rogue? Oh, I was just going to mention the fact that. You do not absolutely have to buy a standard license or the books. Most of the DMs that I've seen DMing have the ultimate and they have the books so that every time you uh, connect to a server, connect to another DM server, you will have the material available. So it's not a rush on getting a standard license or anything like that. You know, you can take your time with the demo, explore around a little bit, and then from there decide what you want to do. I, yeah, I picked up the standard just because that's how I I want to get in and, and figure stuff out and look at things. Um, now I'm trying to figure out um, if I should if I should invest in any of the other stuff. So I think this will this will help, and I'm looking forward to taking some other other classes and things too. Great, awesome. If yes. you don't have physical copies of the books, you probably do want to buy a digital form somewhere just because having something to read in your own time is really nice and helpful. I do have the, um, I've got the player's handbook. So um, I, I do have that. I kind of like the idea of, I mean, I, I've got that and that's, that's great, but I kind of like the idea of being able to, um, to have the information, you know, just click on that and have the stuff pop up. It really is nice to have it digital. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready to go? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. So next step we want to do here is um, we make sure that, okay, first let's recap here. So we connected, kind of lay your screen out. We activated the books that we're going to be accessing today. And at this point, you can close the library activation window and the module activation window, or the library and the module activation window. You can close those now. 
Okay, we're going to create your character now, um, where it says PC on the upper right hand side of your interface. I want you to click that banner and click the plus button. And you only have to do it once. Once that happens, close the character selection window. And you'll have one of those icons up to the upper left. There's there's two profiles up there. Now, I don't know which one is which, but you'll click on one, and if your character sheet pops up, that's yours. And I want you to go ahead and name the character your Discord name. That way I know whose is whose. Okay, I can see your character sheets on my side. I have them both popped up, so I can kind of tell in real time what you guys are doing. Um, one thing you don't want to do when you're creating a character is jump ahead too far because I have to explain stuff and things like that. And I get occasionally I get someone who comes in here and just starts doing stuff. They break their character and we have to start over. So just follow along, relax, it's no, not a race or anything, okay? All right, I'm going to type the standard array of ability scores in the chat window. And your ability scores are on the left-hand side of your character sheet. Those statistics determine the strengths and weaknesses of your character based on a numeric value from 3 to 20. So I'm going to type those in the chat window, and you're going to assign those to whatever section that you want to, provided you kind of already know what kind of character you want to build. And if you're not sure what the strengths and weaknesses of that class is, just go ahead and ask. Okay, that series of numbers is called the standard array. It is a legal safe way to build your character. There are several other methods to do this, but for right now in the tutorial, we're just going to stick with this plan. So I'm not sure what you guys are going to build, but if you want a fighter type, you want to focus probably on strength and constitution. If you're a wizard, I would probably go with dexterity and intelligence, maybe charisma, depending on what type of wizard you're going to be. If you're going to be a healer or a priest or a cleric, um, you probably want to focus on wisdom and maybe constitution, maybe a little bit of strength, depends on what you're going to do. And if you're a rogue, uh, you definitely want to go with dexterity and stuff like that. Yes? And uh, for example, uh, I've, uh, for, uh, what the primary casting ability for Warlock? Uh, charisma. So I, I wanted to, I've, I've been told that the group that I'm going to join, they're looking, they're, it's going to be set in a steampunk type environment and mm -hmm. they need a healer. So they want me to be, uh, do a, a doctor type character. So okay. I'm kind of, I have no idea. Because usually when I play, I play either um, a ranger or something like that. Gotcha. I'm not sure how the steampunk is going to play out, but I definitely for this, you probably want wisdom. Okay. Are you using 5th edition? That's what I've been told. I haven't gotten very much information yet. Okay. Do you know if they're using the modern magic or... Um, I think it's, um, the, I think so far what, what they've told me is that, um, the, the good gods have kind of gone away and the evil gods have hung out and are still messing with humans and there's going to be some sort of artifact find. I don't, I, I'm not really sure. Okay. But they have no healer in the group. Well, one, uh, good way of doing a healer is to simply take the healer feet. It does a really okay. good job of doing that because instead of being like, I'm a cleric who has this divine magic or I'm a bard who casts these healing spells, it's just, I've been trained to use this healer's kit and I can use it to heal people. Gotcha. It so, might better communicate that theme of a like medic type thing. Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, from my side, uh, I've read uh, a little of uh, wiki on uh, the healer matter and uh, I think one of uh, Druid's uh, circles 
uh, could be uh, could provide a very good healing options. So that's if uh, oh the druid um, of yes. the shepherd. Uh, well, probably no. Uh, one that have like uh, 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 almost lay on hands, but it's uh, like always separated in halves, and uh, uh, it also gives uh, bonus uh, hit points. It's uh, not a shepherd; it's a previous one before shepherd. Uh, oh, you mean from the under Arcana? Okay. Uh, but it was a nice decoration, but I think we should return to the procedure. Yep. Okay, so the next thing um, I want you to do is keep in mind that for Fantasy Grounds, in the way you build a character, there is a certain order. So I want you guys to remember this or write it down. Um, you always want to start with your ability scores first. Okay? And what you want to keep in mind is the race that you might pick for your character. So... For instance, if you know that you're a, an elf, you'll probably end up getting dexterity or charisma or intelligence bonus to that. So this is something that when you get more experienced, you'll, you'll know that stuff more. I don't expect you to remember all that, but there is a table uh, in the um, campaign guide or in the, uh, the player's handbook in the reference guide that will show you what races get what things and there's also a way to look it up ahead of time but for the tutorial we're just going to go with what you got um we don't want to spend a lot of time doing all this research to build the characters and that's probably something you guys want to do once you get your hands on some books or you can even look online there's some charts and tables and when you build a character you kind of want to do a little bit of research beforehand but this is a training tutorial so it's it's all good Okay, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to pick the race. Now, over to the right-hand side of the interface, there's a race banner. I want you to click on that. You should see a race banner there. And you should see a list of races. Um, if any of those look interesting to you, what I'd like you to do is there's a little round circle, which is a buckler shield. Just single left click on it, hold your left mouse button down, and drag it over to your character sheet where it says race. Okay. So Berkey, by picking a human, you actually get plus one to all your scores. So if you look at your ability scores, they all gone up by one. Nice. The thing you lose though is the dark vision, which a lot get of get the variant human for the feet too. Yeah, well, we're we're just gonna do the uh, the standard human for now. But he's right; you can do the human variant, and that would give you the feet. But I'm not expecting you to know that right now. And anyways, um, the half-elf gets a charisma bonus, it looks like, um, and a couple other things like the dark vision. So you actually benefited by picking the, the half-elf questioner because you got the charisma bonus. Um, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if that was luck or if that was planned, but uh, it definitely benefited you. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is pick your background. So on the right-hand side of the interface, you can click your background. And if you see a background that you think kind of makes sense for your build or something you're interested in, just drag it over to your background section. And while you're picking these characters, it will ask you occasionally for pop-ups. So make sure that you're clicking on the options that it gives you, if it does.
And if you look to the left on your interface, it'll show you all the things that's being added to your character. And this is part of the automation process that is comes with Fantasy Grounds. Now, if you don't like what you've picked, um, don't delete it and redrag another one over because it kind of breaks your character. So when you get ready to drag something over, make sure that's what you want. Um, once you've dragged it over, you can't go back. So it's you essentially either have to go through manually and figure out everything that's changed and change it back, or you're going to have to restart your character. So just letting you know, once you pick one of those backgrounds or any of the races or classes, there's, it's hard to go back. Okay, and then that last thing I want you guys to do is go ahead and click on the classes, which is another banner. And if you're going to be a healer, that'd probably be a cleric or a druid. If you're going to be a warlock, you'll also pick warlock. However, it may ask you what type of cleric or what what area of domain that you're going to be. Same thing with the warlock. I'm not sure when you get that archetype. I think it's second or third level. But it will ask you what archetype do you want to play eventually. And we're going to level up. It asks for other world patron yep. uh, right from the start. Yep. And I think the cleric gets the same thing. It wants the domain right from the start. No, I didn't get anything like that. I just got uh, choose two skills from the list below. Okay. So it might come up in second or third level. Oh, okay. So it, each class is a little bit different, but there are some that get it at first, some that get it at second, and some that get it at third. And usually the spellcasters get them a little sooner than the other other classes. Okay, so I want you guys to remember this build order. So you use abilities, race, or background. You can interchange those two. And then class and level. So that's the order of building. If you skip that and you just start filling things out, it will cause you some grief and you won't get the full automation of Fantasy Grounds. It did now after I chose the um, the skills, then it popped up with the domain. Right. Okay. Okay, so the next step we're going to do is we're going to level your character up and I'll show you the proper way to do it is to just drag over the same class that you drag over earlier into the same spot. So you're adding another layer basically on top of what you already have. And if you get any pop-ups, just pay attention to them. And that's how you level up properly in Fantasy Grounds. So for the Warlock, you just find that Warlock again, drop it on top of the same spot. And let's go ahead and go up to level three. All right, perfect. You see how simple that was? There's no filling stuff out right now or anything like that. You don't have to type anything in at this point. Fantasy Grounds takes care of the leveling process fairly decently. It's not perfect, but pretty close. Any questions so far? Mm -mm, nope. Okay. Everything clear. Okay. So I'm going to explain a few things on this page before we move on. So in the center of your character sheet, you have your armor class, your intelligence, and your speed. All of those things are derived from your abilities or your race or even sometimes armor or whatever you have for equipment or even magic items. So if you click on the little magnifying glass next to the shield, it's kind of light. It's kind of hard to see. 
I'm going to actually change the background color a little bit so that you guys can see those hourglasses or the, or the magnifying glass because they're kind of washed out with this background. Uh, it's changing kind of like to a dark blue. And that's supposed to signify that it's nighttime or you're inside of a cave or something like that. But you should be able to see those uh, magnifying glasses a lot easier now. Okay, if you look at that, it shows you a stack up or the sources of that final value. So you look at the rows there. So you have intelligence, speed, and armor. And those are read from left to right. And that just gives you an idea of where those are, scores are coming from. Now, early on in character creation, there isn't a whole lot here because you guys don't have armor, things like that enabled yet. But that's where all this would be reflected. This would also show if you had any miscellaneous adjustments for like magic items per se. So sometimes uh, your DM has to manually put in the miscellaneous number to account for that. But if it's coded correctly, you won't have to manually put the stuff in usually. So I just wanted you to see that that is there. That's what that is. It's a, basically the stack up of what comes to that final number on your character sheet. So for armor class, that's the bottom row there that has all the different variables that can go into it. Speed, well, that's determined by your race, but you can also have armor penalties and things like that, or, or advantages depending on what sort of armor you have. And then initiative would come from your dexterity and then maybe possibly a magic item or something like that. So you can go ahead and close that now. Okay, down below you'll see your hit points. There's a wound category, a max, and a temp. So your wounds are obviously when you get injured, it would be a negative to that number. It would probably be a smaller number than 18 or 24, depending on what your what your max is. And temp would be just temporary hit points that you gain from spells or potions. Now the hit points are calculated automatically in Fantasy Grounds. And what it does is it gives you maximum hit dice per level at the, f well, at the first level you get maximum hit die plus your constitution bonus. So if you, if you have a, a, a value greater than 12, you'll get a, a plus for each level. So in the case of Pleshner, you have a 15 con, so you're getting plus two for each level on top of your hit die. And then each successive level after level one, you get the average of your hit die per level added to your score. Now, if you don't like the score, you think it's too low or something like that or too overpowered, you can talk to your dungeon master and re-roll those manually and just change the number. So your hit dice is actually on the very bottom. If you click that magnifying glass next to where it says HD, It'll show you your base stat, if there's a secondary or a miscellaneous for health calculations. And over to the right of it is the actual death saves. So when you die and you go to zero hit points and you're in the combat tracker and you're fighting and you know you're, you went, you basically you go down from from dying or or a severe wound. Um, Fantasy Grounds automatically will keep track of that if the DM has that option enabled in the settings. So in other words, when you're up there playing and you're on the combat tracker, when it comes to your turn, even though you're not fighting or doing anything at that time, you still have the opportunity to possibly survive that wound. And so Fantasy Grounds automatically rolls the dice for you. And you can do it manually. So if you click on the little 20-sided dice in that section, it will roll a death save. And depending on your constitution, things like that will determine if you fail or succeed. And you, you're given three fails and three successes. And if you roll a one, I believe it's an instant death. Uh -huh. 
I uh, watched a few games recently, and I think uh, one or twenty. It's like just two yeah. trailers or two successes. Right, right. It 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 feeds it up basically. On a twenty, you come back at one HP. You're still prone, and on a one, you take two failures. Okay. Any questions about that? Nope. Okay. So, also, on the top right of your character sheet, next to where it says proficiency plus two, it says prof plus two, there's another magnifying glass I'd like you guys to look at. Okay. So this shows your class and level, and if you were multi-classed, like you had two classes, it would show in here as well, of how many levels you had per. Um, what I'd like you guys to do is in the XP, I'd like you to type in 900, because that's your starting experience points for 5th edition. Now, other game systems may require different ranges of experience, like we have an Explorer's Guild that actually uses a different system of rewarding levels and experience points so it would be 100 per level but in this case we're just going to do the fifth edition way and for the next level for fifth edition rules it's 2700 if you're doing explorers guild it would just be 400 so in the next level section just type 2700 and that is a manual process so you have to pay attention to the levels as you're get awarded XP. So when your DM rewards those to you, it'll populate the XP field, but it does not level your character up for you. So this is a bookkeeping section here. And while you have that open, you'll see a little shield there on the line where your class is. All the way to the right, it's underneath the edit button. That is the, the, the description of your class. What I'd like you guys to do is left click on it and hold it and drag it down to a little toolbar that's on the bottom of your character sheet. You'll have a number of 1 through 12 or something like that on the bottom. If you drag that down there, it'll actually create a shortcut and you won't have to come back here. And if you actually click on the shortcut that you just made, it'll pop up with the description of your class. You guys getting that? Yep. Okay. Yes. Yes. Good. And I want you to do the same thing for your background and your race. So near the top of your character, there's two shields there. I want you to also drag those down to a separate cell on the bottom of the shortcut area. That way you'll be able to go back and refer to those when you're building your character. And I'm also showing you the feature of using shortcuts. So anytime you see a shield like that, you can, in effect, drag those to the toolbar and create yourself a shortcut so you don't have to look around for the stuff in the, in the future. That's awesome. Yes. That actually makes it a lot quicker, too, when you're playing. And you can do it with maps and all kinds of stuff. So if there's a map that the DM has shared with you, you can technically drag that map, the, the shortcut, into there. Okay, so any questions on this front sheet? I'm going to have you do one more shortcut, and then we're going to move on to skills. No, I'm good. Okay. So when you're asked to do an initiative roll in the game when you're playing, it's in the very center of your character sheet. So if you just hover your mouse, up, if you mouse over where it says initiative, your pointer will turn into a hand, which indicates that that's a dice roll. So you can click on it and have it roll, into, it'll roll your initiative into the uh, chat window. So where it says INIT in the center of your character sheet, if you click that, that actually does your initiative roll. And that determines the combat order or the order of progression in a 
encounter. The higher the better. Now technically you can actually drag this roll to your toolbar. So if you don't double click it or whatever, you just single click, pick the dice up actually, left click and hold it and drag it down to the toolbar. You can roll your uh, initiative right from the toolbar. But there is a drawback with doing rolls from from uh, shortcut bar. The links that you guys just did are fine. Those will be okay. It's just the rolls. Like if you shortcut your dice rolls down to that toolbar, those do not level up with your character. So let's just say you go up to fourth level or you get a magic item or whatever the scenario is. You will not have the correct value in that shortcut because it takes a snapshot of what your character is now and it will not calculate any new adjustments that you've made for your character as you level up. So we just have to delete that one and make a new one if we wanted to continue to use that, right? Correct. So okay. you have to manage those shortcuts that are rolls. So if you put on a ring of initiative or something, you're going to have to redo it. If you have a curse or some sort of spell effect on you, it's not going to reflect that. So if anything that affects your dexterity or your intelligence or your initiative or even potions sometimes do that. So you have to keep that in mind. You may have to end up rolling right off your character sheet. That's the safest way to do it. But if it's an everyday thing that you're going to be running for months and things like that, it, it's probably okay. You just have to make sure you, you manage them. And you can also do any of those ability checks or ability saves. So your checks are done on the left, which is a contested strength check. So you probably have to roll over a certain number and you would just click on strength if that's what it was. So the DM could set a uh, some sort of challenge rating, let's say a 10. And if you didn't roll over a 10, then you would have failed. And then there's also strength saves. So let's say you were climbing a rope, you slipped, you had one last chance to grab the ledge, so let's roll a dexterity check. Yep. And then when you actually grab hold of the ledge, you have all that weight to hold. So let's make a strength save. The strengths are over to the top right, and I would set a value based on how much weight you had on you and things like in the conditions. So let's do a strength save. So if you rolled above a 10, you would have actually grabbed the ledge or an item or a root or something like that, and you would have held your fall. I failed all of those rolls. Yeah, so you fell down the cliff. You're dead. <laughs> but anyways, that's, that's kind of how that would work in a, in a role-playing scenario. Now, I would have had you guys roll those actually in the dice tower. So if it was a strength check, I would have probably said, go ahead and roll in the dice tower, and which you would just drag it down to the dice tower itself. So instead of clicking from the character sheet, you just pull it down and, and drop it in the dice tower itself. And I would see the results. And instead of saying, hey, beat a 10, and then you roll a number, and let's say you got a 12 or something, then I would say, oh, you got a 12. You succeeded. Now, how boring is that? A good DM would say, you have fallen, you're, you've lost your grip, and you know, you're know you basically at a risk of falling. What do you do? And then you'd say, well, I'm going to try to grab the rope. So I would have you do a dexterity check, and if you made that save with the role of the uh, dexterity, I would explain that to you in gaming term, in role play terms. So I'd say, you just barely grab on the rope, it's very slippery, and, and then I'd say, but the weight of your body is, you know, made you feel uh, like you're going to slip again, uh, make a strength check. And so you would roll the check in the dice tower, and based on your success is how I would describe the situation. Like if you barely held, or if you had no trouble doing it, or if you actually let go. So that's why I use the dice tower. It's 
a role-playing element and it's also a way to deter people from metagaming so if you're in a scenario where someone had to make a critical check to save the party if you actually see that number and that person rolls beneath a 10 you're probably going to react differently so that's why they're hidden any questions on that no that's really cool though yeah it's supposed to be that way now it depends on the dm but as you get more experience you realize that the game is not about numbers the game is more or less about the story and so as you get used to to, to knowing what those numbers are and what they mean you can kind of translate them into a story as opposed to just giving values occasionally it's okay to give a value like i might say hey you rolled a 20 you know just for the sake of of the game but i wouldn't do that too often i would try to describe your degree of success instead of just saying hey you rolled a 20 that would be like a a, a really good save in, in your in your situation if you roll a 20 and you made a strength check not only did you grab the rope and hold but you also grabbed your backpack and was able to hold on to it while you were doing that and so that's the difference for the role-playing aspect so there is degrees of success but that's all based on the the dm okay we're going to go to the skills tab now so any questions on that anything no everything clear yep okay um while we're here though i want you to double click on your portrait picture on your character sheet and i would like you to find some sort of portrait and i don't really care what it is at this point but that's you will assign yourself a portrait at this point and when you export your characters it normally doesn't save the the picture so you might have to reassign it or find your own copy of a picture. So when you export your character, you don't get that portrait normally, especially if it's someone else's table. And it defaults as your token on the battle map as well. So to the left is your portrait and to the right is your token. Now, essentially you can have a portrait and a token, but if you don't have any tokens, it will default as your token. Does that make sense? It does, yep. Okay, so when you're on a battle map, that's what you're gonna have. The one to the right is going to be your actual token on the map. The one on the left is supposed to be a portrait profile picture, but if you don't have tokens, it becomes your token. Okay, so yep, let's go to the skills tab. And you'll see a list of skills. Now those are all the skills that are legal and available for fifth edition. And you may want to drag your character sheets down some. So on the bottom right corner, you just click and hold and kind of drag it out a little bit so you have a little bit more vision. Okay, so those are all the skills that are available for you to do. They all come up in different situations or scenarios. Um, those are basically everything that most of your characters can do. Um, just because you don't have a yellow star by it does not mean you can't do it. You're just not trained and as successful at it as far as training and uh, experience goes. What that also means is that you can add your ability modifier. So if you have a plus one, let's say, on your charisma, you can add the plus one and you can also add your proficiency modifier. And your proficiency goes up with every four or five levels, depending on what, what character build you have. And so that number starts off as two, and it will go up over time. So it'll become plus three, then after three or four more levels, it'll become plus four, and so on and so forth. So these scores will actually increase as your character increases. And also you get ability level ups at sometimes, unless you're a human variant, in which you're... You know, you could sacrifice uh, an ability score increase for a feat. But uh, anyway, so your ability scores go up and your proficiency bonus goes up. So that total over to the right ends up being a larger number over time, depending on your character build. 
um lauren if i could jump in real quick um if you could uh put the uh, discord link in the uh, chat for people that are watching in case they haven't joined the college yet um by the way i'm fat ninja dm one of the teacher's aides here at the college um anybody watching anybody just joining um just don't be afraid to ask any questions um we'll get to them as much as po as quickly as possible we do have some uh, very smart people here of course our founder and we have thomas and rogue and um you know if we put our uh great minds together we can answer almost any questions so please don't feel uh shy to ask questions yeah um the uh discord uh link is actually in our discord which doesn't help people watching from the outside so for anyone in the college that already knows the resource folder in there is the the permanent link for the discord and well i tried just... putting that in there but uh it got nuked so oh, okay it's probably it because you're nuked. not a moderator so i'll have to do it yeah, yeah. okay no problem So while you guys are looking at those skills, I want you guys to think about how your character would would use those skills in certain situations. If there is something there that you don't understand, I can explain a couple of them if you need to. So you go down that list there, and if anything does not make sense or you're not sure how it would be used in a game session, please ask and I'll kind of try to give you the best answer I can. Are you guys familiar with that type of thing? Um, yeah, and then I was just clicking on some of the the descriptions also. Yeah, that's the way to do it for sure. Um, the one that's come up the most in most sessions is perception. That tends to be overused, but it is something that's asked all the time. So if you were to grab the dice where it says plus three, I guess, would it be, or plus one, Right there, you can click from there and it will actually make a perception check. Or you can just drag it to the dice tower, which is where, where most people would want you to do it. And you can also make a shortcut out of it. And just keep in mind, same thing applies. If you do that and your character goes up in level or something happens to your character, that shortcut will have to be changed. So any questions on skills? Because I'm going to show you guys how to make your own custom skill. Nope, I'm good. Okay. Occasionally, there are things that are not covered. And so what I want you guys to do is go to your Abilities tab. And we're going to come back to Skills, but go to your Abilities tab and look at your proficiencies in the middle of your character sheet. And if you see any tools or kits or anything like that, we can actually turn those into a skill. And also instruments, gaming sets, anything like that, we can turn that into a skill. Yes, uh, that's gaming set for me. Okay. What would be the benefit of that? There's a couple things I'll show you. Let's go ahead and make the skill first. Okay. So it looks like you have you both have a gaming set. Okay, perfect. So go to the back to the skills area. And for this case, the benefit of it is going to be to show you that you can make your own skills, but I'll also tell you the other benefits. Okay, so on the bottom right-hand corner, there is a circle with a line through it. That is the edit button. If you click that, you'll see a green plus button appear near the top where it says skills. And that will create a new line in the skills section. 
and then I just want you to type gaming set and it can be dragon dice or cards or whatever you want it to be but for this tutorial I would just let's just put gaming set dice or gaming set chess or I think it's called dragon chess and then they have a dice it's basically dice cards chess things like that so whatever you think would be fun or cool for your character just type that in and also make sure it has the star turned yellow next to the skill that you're creating so you are proficient with that and that it will allow you to add your proficiency bonus and your stat bonus to it. So whatever you think makes sense for the gaming dice, that it should be based on. So you would cycle through where it says stat, you would actually keep clicking on stat until you found an ability that would make sense for that particular gaming set. And I leave that up to the characters to interpret, unless it's not something stupid like strength or something. Okay, so the benefit of this is, let's say you went into a, a role-playing scenario where you were going to use your gaming set for either entertainment or to gain money or just for killing time. So what I would have you do is roll this set of dice um, or play these cards or whatever the, the, the item is. And it may be that you need to beat somebody in order to get through to talk to somebody else or something like that. So I'd have you roll those checks based on your proficiency. And the only real advantage to it is it automatically combines your proficiency bonus with your stat bonus with a description of what you're doing. So if you look at the, uh, if you just roll it straight, just roll the uh, check in the uh, chat window you'll get the description there and it actually tells you what it is that you rolled and the modifier and the intelligence bonus proficiency or whatever you based on. And so gotcha. what that does, it creates a record also in Fantasy Grounds. So I can go back through a log, all these chat things in the chat log actually, um, there's a record and it turns out to be an HTML file. And I can go through that log and I say, oh yeah, she won that gambling set or she won that, that tournament or whatever it is. Now, this is just a, an example from a gaming set, but you have healing kits, you have thieves tools, things like that are kind of critical for the game. This, this stuff here is more for role play, but for like performing, um, like for bards, they have instruments, things like that, that would come into play for that. And if it's labeled, instead of doing a, a standard, you know, intelligence check or whatever, it will bring in your stat bonus plus your proficiency bonus, plus it provides a description of what it was. Because your DM could just essentially make, have you just roll a, let's say you base it on intelligence, say make an intelligence check, add your proficiency and your uh, skill bonus to it. And that, that would be another way to handle it but i think that this way is a lot cleaner and a lot a lot nicer especially if you're a rogue or an assassin or something like that it just makes more sense to have it labeled and added to your sheet now this can also be artisan tools so if you guys have crafting and you guys want to do some of that stuff in your off hours or downtime and if your dm allows for that he might have you make some rolls to see how successful you are with with creating stuff Okay, so that's kind of how that, I just wanted you to see that you can add your own skills and you have a little idea of why. Any other questions here? No. No. Okay, let's go back to your ability section. Now you have features that come from your class or your background. You have traits if you're a non-human. So if you're human, you're not gonna have any specific traits. Um, your proficiencies are listed there based on your background and your class and even sometimes your race. And then you have languages. So on the very bottom of your sheet, 
if it says choice or one of your choice or choose two or anything like that, you need to pick some other languages. So I would say just for the sake of the tutorial, I'm not going to expect you to know all the different available languages. I would just do Dwarvish, and I mean, it must be spelled with a capital D. So if it says choice, just replace that with the word Dwarvish. And that's D-W-A-R-V-I-S-H with a capital D. So edit your languages on the bottom there of the abilities tab on the very bottom. And I think you get one more, Berkey. I do. Okay. How about Elvish? I also do. Okay. I do. How about Gnome or Halfling or something like that? All right. So now what I want to show you guys is the language filter in the chat area. So if you've spelt this correctly on your character sheet, you can use the drop down um, bubble in the character um, chat window on the left. There's a little drop down. It looks like a white field with a little bubble in there. And there's a little black arrow. If you click that, you can select one of those languages that's on your character sheet. And those won't appear there unless you have it spelt correctly. And so if you drop one of those down and select one of those languages and you type it in the chat field and you hit enter, it'll actually send out a chat with a coded language if you don't have it in your inventory. Okay. So uh, Berkey, do one in Halfling so that Fleshner won't understand it. You see what I'm saying? I think it's spelled uh, incorrectly because uh, it's, uh, or it should be like that. Yeah, I don't uh, know. It's... Maybe there's no halfling language. So Berkey, let's change halfling to gnome. So the language has to be available. I, my, I've probably given her a bad example. Okay, now check the drop down and change it to gnome. And then try well, that. That doesn't show up. I wonder if I messed that up somehow. Let me see. Oh, excuse me, it's gnome-ish. That's why. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Yep. So that's just wanted you guys to know that you have to have it spelled correctly. And it also has to be available in your setting. So that's up to you and your DM for how that works. Another cool feature that I'll go ahead and select no language or just a blank. So you don't have the, the different language selected. Another thing, cool thing about Fantasy Grounds, you can whisper to one another. So you can right click on your and your friends, your allies, and, t and whisper. I have the option to turn that on or off. I can see it or not. I have it off right now. So you guys can say bad things about me. I wouldn't know it. Another thing you can do is on your own profile picture, if you right click on your own photo, you can set AFK so that lets the DMs and the other players know that you're not at your keyboard. So any other questions about that? No. Okay.
All right, so that's some of the cool features that Fantasy Grounds has. Um, I think it's a really cool program. Once you get used to it and how it works, it, it works very well. Um, the next thing we're going to do is go to your inventory tab. We will come back to your features, but those are more for, like, I want to say, um, creating the customization of your character. I want to get through the interface before we get to the customization part. So let's go to your inventory. We will be going back to the ability section, but just not now. Okay, so this is where your equipment and your treasure and where you keep track of how heavy or how much of a load that you have on your character. Now each one of you has a maximum and you also have your lift, push, and drag value and then your current carrying value. Right now you have zero. And we're going to change that. So I don't know if you guys remembered the shortcuts I had you guys create earlier. But if you click on the background section for your character and you scroll down to the bottom, you'll have a list of things that you will be given at first level or in the beginning of your career. You guys will have something similar because you have a similar background. You guys are both um, nobles. So you get one type of gaming set. So you guys can actually... Um, over to the right hand side of your interface is an items section. It looks like a sword and armor. If you click that, there'll be a whole list of stuff. Type gaming set at the bottom there and you should be able to find a set. And then you would drag that over to your character's equipment section on the inventory tab. Hmm, I'm not finding anything. Uh, it's not gaming set, it's uh, just uh, draconic chess set or dice set. Just type set and it will show. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, also, you should get a set of fine clothing, so just type in the word clothes. Looks like you get a signet ring and a scroll of pedigree. Now those may not be in the equipment section, so we'll skip that for right now, but you can actually make your own uh, Material. Signet ring is present. Good. Now the scroll of pedigree, you can just type a scroll and just and then just drag that over. So if you see a blank scroll that has no magical value to it, you can actually scroll and or put that over in your inventory. So if you see just a scroll, that that might work too. So that's a case. So yeah, there's a case, map, or scroll. Yep, that works. So that's a map or scroll case. Okay, that works. That's what you hold it in. But if you need some parchment or something, that, that would be it. Okay. 
And then you can detail later on, like when you build your character, as to what that actually says, things like that. And you get 25 gold, which is a nice starting amount. So you type 25 in the treasure area, and then next to it on the line, you would type GP in lowercase. All right? So all your items go in the equipment section. All your treasure, the coins, go in the treasure area. Like gemstones or anything, artwork or anything that would go in the equipment area. So you guys have any questions about the equipment? We're going to add some more stuff. Um, this is just from your background. Nope, good. Okay. So let's go to your... Um, you can close the background for right now. And let's go to your class and scroll down towards the bottom of it and you'll see the equipment starting list for your class. Uh, since there's a lull in the action, I'd like to Go ahead and let everybody know that we do have a lot of uh, game groups over here on our Discord server. We have Pathfinder games. We have 5e, regular 5e, 5e homebrew. Um, we're even going to have some Starfinder getting ready to come up shortly. So if you're looking for a gaming group to uh, join up with, with some really cool people, come on over to our Discord server and check us out. So if you scroll down on your um, class, you'll be able to see your start equipment. And you get this in addition to the equipment that you just got. And there are links, or there should be links there to the equipment itself. So there'll be a weapon list, an armor list, adventuring gear, and tools. So if you look at those, it says you can um, have certain weapons, and there'll be the or statement, so make sure you pay attention to those. So if you click on the weapon list, you can select your weapons from there. And you just drag those over to your equipment. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I have... Uh variant uh, component pouch and an arcane focus but uh, i cannot find it uh, i remember from reading all well, the description that the crystal for example can be an arcane focus and i have it in like in description of crystal uh, mm -hmm. it's present that it's arcane focus so i'm adding crystal directly that's correct, correct? yes that's exactly right So any of the miscellaneous stuff is going to be an adventuring gear, probably, or the tools. And I'm going to take a bio break and just take your time and go through that list of things that you get and drag those over onto your character sheet. And remember, if you have, like, let's just say... Uh, gold right now you probably want to grab a pouch too and drag that to your character and then if you have like let's just say crossbow or crossbow bolts you're probably going to want to pick something to hold it with so the crossbow bolts actually have a uh, a case and if you have a bow and arrow then you're going to pick a you know a bow and some arrows and a quiver to hold it in and if it gives you uh, a backpack or a pack of some sort, it'll say a scholar's pack or dungeoneer's pack or something like that. When you drag those over, it will actually explode your list even greater. You'll have a bunch more stuff. So go ahead and take your time taking that gear. I'll be back in like three, four minutes, and then we'll continue the lesson.
and while Laroon is uh, taking his bio break, I, I played in um, Ferret's Portal Palooza game last night, and it was absolutely amazing. It was really fun. We had a blast with it. Um, his next session is actually tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. I don't know if he's going to stream it or not, and unfortunately, all the spots he have open are now filled. But uh, please support him. Uh, he's worked very hard along with Inski and uh, two of the other great teachers that we have here at the, the college. So if you can get into one of those games, I highly recommend you get into it. It is really cool. He switches things up. It's a, like I said, he worked, the ferret worked very hard on it. And it definitely shows in the, um, the execution of his gameplay and how, how he runs things. And um, also on top of that, we have other affiliates. We have a uh, sleeper Island games going. Uh, we do have DMS that run adventure league games also. So if people are interested in that, go ahead and get a hold of them on our discord servers. Um, like I said, we've been running a lot of 5e of course, cause that's the current hotness right now, but we do spread out into other things like Pathfinder. And I think I even heard of a, a couple of fate games maybe are in the works. So if people are looking to get into fate or even the cipher system like Numenera or the strange, there are some whispers of that stuff getting ready to start happening here on the Discord server also. So just come over to the server, check us out. You will not be disappointed. We have a great community. It's almost like a family more than a, a community. So yeah, just come on over, check us out. You will not be disappointed. There's a lot of great teachers and also a lot of great players. So with that, when Lauren comes back, we'll be ready to go. Ah, perfect timing. <laughs> yep. So, Plushner, if you need to get some water or something, be a good time. No, thank you. I think I finished the equipment section.
Okay, you guys ready to go? Yep. Yes. Okay. It's always nice to take a little break. Okay, so let's get this going. So you got your inventory. Um, looks like you got quite a bit of stuff, actually. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is look at the word backpack, and that's pretty much where all your stuff's going to be stored. Um, I want you to delete the empty um, section there where it says empty, and we're going to actually fill that backpack up with stuff. So you can actually edit that, and it will say just backpack instead of empty. And I'm going to show you guys how to organize your inventory. Okay, so next to each item, there's a location line. So if you look across it'll, where it says location, that is where you're going to type what is stored where. So for the crossbow bolt, you want to put that in the case. So what you're going to do is next to bolt or crossbow bolt, you're going to type the word case, comma, whatever it goes to. Yep. And also, for anything that's going to be stored in your backpack, I would like you to type the word backpack in the location on the right hand side next to the item that's going to be stored in the backpack. So make sure it's a capital B as well. And it'll auto spell it for you. So if you just put a capital B in there, it'll it'll populate it for you. And you want to make sure it's in capitals, not not uh, lowercase. And when you get done entering something, you do not have to hit enter. And that's what will create the extra lines in your inventory. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I'm actually deleting the extra ones. And so you just right click on the shield and hit the skull and crossbones and that'll delete any extra lines that you make. So when you're done um, editing that line, you don't have to enter. That's a common thing. You can either hit the tab button or you can just click on a different line. You don't have to hit enter to confirm or anything like that. You want to make sure that the location section that you're typing matches the exact case and spelling as the container. And that will reshuffle your inventory and organize it for you. So that's kind of what I'm trying to show you guys. There's a few other things too here that I have to show you. And then once you're done organizing and the stuff that you you know for, that's going in your backpack, if you just click anywhere in your equipment area, it'll reshuffle your your equipment list. It doesn't do it right away, so you might have to you might have to click a couple times, but it doesn't always do it right away. You'll see it shuffle, and it will put it in a hierarchy. It'll be organized.
Okay, so are you guys pretty much done shuffling your inventory around? Mm-hmm. Pleasure. Yes. Okay. Um, All right. So there's something I want you guys to notice on the right-hand side next to the weight of the backpack. So look for your backpack again. And when you find it, what I want you to do is, let's see, um, there's a symbol next to the backpack. And it, it'll look like a shirt or a bag or something that you're carried or equipped. <clears throat> there's three states here. You can have it carried, <clears throat> it can be equipped, or you don't have it on you. So if you cycle through that, we're ne right next to backpack, if you cycle through that, it'll change to a different status. I want you to cycle through it, there you go, to where it's nothing. So just be a blank circle. So pleasure where it says backpack, you click on the little shirt where it says, okay, now look at your guys' weight down below, your current weight, and then click the backpack, um, click it back on and look at your weight again, and you'll see that the weight resumes to be larger. Okay? So that would be symbolic of you dropping your backpack or having it stolen or stashing it somewhere. So in a, in a role-playing scenario, I might say, hey, you have to jump 12 feet across a, a, a ravine to make it. And it's going to be a really tough, you know, a tough challenge for you. If you actually thought about loosening your backpack and stashing it somewhere or having someone hold it for you while you jump across, I might actually make that challenge a little bit less for you. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. So... Or you could be waking up one morning and traveling around and I say, hey, you feel a little loose or a little light this morning. And you go look at your inventory and you go, hey, what happened to my stuff? Well, I would have gone, went to your character sheet, clicked that button, and the stuff would be basically considered stolen at that point or lost. Or maybe you made the statement that you want to keep all your heavy equipment and hide it somewhere or keep it back in your inn where you're staying, something like that, you could do that too. So that's kind of how that works. Any questions on inventory? Nope. Okay, let's go to your notes. Okay. All right, good. Let's go to your notes section. Okay. So the main thing that I want you guys to know about in this section is this is the role play stuff mostly. There are only two mechanical things here that, that affect the game, and that's your size, which is, should already be there, and your alignment. So you need to pick an alignment that you think would fit your character, and it must be spelled out, no acronyms. So if you're lawful, good, it has to be a capital L and a capital G. If it's... Neutral good needs to be capital N with a capital G. Okay, don't worry about your deity right now. Um, depends on what world you're in as far as who you worship. Um, you know, you put your gender, age, weight, height, all that stuff in later, or you can do it now if you want. But uh, there's a couple things I wanted to show you on this character sheet that is kind of cool. Um, for your personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws, those are a mechanic that 5th edition really tried to, to uh, push for role play. So if you go back to your background shortcut that we looked at earlier, the actual shortcut that we made, if you click on that and you scroll to the very bottom, there's a list of suggested traits. And each one of those is a table. And you can either roll on that table or you can pick the one that you think fits your character the best. And what happens is if you roll it, it goes into the chat window, in which case you can take the actual text that's sitting there in the chat window and drag it up to your character. So you do not have to retype the information. Or if you don't want to roll on the table, you can actually just drag the text right from the table and put it into the applicable section. 
So you can either roll on the tables or you can just drag the text over. So you're not dragging the shield, you're dragging the actual text from the table itself. So you just pick one or two from each section and put it on your list. Now if you don't like those, you can make up your own. That's a pretty good starting point, and if you don't know or what to think of, you, that's a good way to, to do that. Um, for my table, when I play, I actually reward characters if they fill this all out, including the appearance and the notes. And then I, have to, I often ask for a backstory if it's going to be a long campaign. And I've had people write me you know, quite a few paragraphs on their character, and I actually reward that with experience points. This sheet actually right here is most important to me. I actually build a story around your background, so it may not come up right away, but somewhere in the game during the sessions that we play, little bits and pieces of your history in your background will come up. So this isn't totally necessary at this time to fill all this out, but I just wanted you guys to see where it was and that you don't have to retype everything. Is there any questions on this sheet? No, that makes it a lot faster, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. You can make up your own list and drag them over too. How would you do that? Well, in Fantasy Grounds, you have a thing, a tab called Notes. You probably don't see that now because you're in the PC creation. But you can mm -hmm. make notes, and you just copy and paste them from outside and paste them into the Notes section. Oh. And save okay. It. So if you want to do something later, you can always copy and paste and just paste it into the character sheet in here. Okay. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way, just send it to your DM and have them add it to it. Do you take away XP for that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next section we're going to check out is the log. This is for um, organized play. It's called Adventure League. Um, if you join Adventure League, there's a website for it. It's free. You just register and you get that DCI number, which is kind of like your ID number. I guess it'd be like a social security number. And basically, that goes on your characters when you play from game to game. And you would pick a faction, and then you just record all your adventures and your gear and experiences in that log. Um, you have to play in a legal module with a legal DM and a legal setup. So it's not really that strict, but it, it does have some rules. I didn't know clerics had social security back in those days. Did they have food stamps too? No, I was playing. <laughs> they do, actually. <laughs> That's that hospitality they get from the temples. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. They get that southern hospitality. You're right. Oh, I was just uh, plugging your palooza there, uh, Ferret. Um, oh, thanks, Ninja. <laughs> okay. Uh, no problem. So the next step here is let's go to the actions tab. This is the fun part. Okay, if you have any ammunition, you need to change that number where it says ammo. And for the dagger plessner, you can just put one since you only have one on you. I actually have two daggers. Okay, put two. Into world. So you can throw them. Okay. Now, there are things you can do to change the uh, usage and how the actual 
item is going to change or affect things. So I'm going to show you guys how to code your first weapon or how to add your own weapons here. So the uh, before we do that, though, on your crossbow, if you click on the, uh, the dice that's next to it, next to that bow, it'll actually roll an attack roll and it will check off one of your ammunition. Nice. The only thing it doesn't do is recover, so that's up to you and your DM. So if, you, if I wanted to go and pick up, if, if I wanted to pick up one of my bolts, okay. Right. The way I rule it at my table is if, uh, let's say you shoot five in a round or, or in a in a battle, I count the ones that hit as gone. They're basically done. You know, they shatter or the tip gets bent right. or whatever. The ones that are lost that you missed, I try to give it an idea of how many you actually lost. And I just usually give you a chance to recover them based on how many are out there. I just give you an average, like maybe half of them or something. Okay. The other way I can do it is if you consciously said, hey, I want to keep track of my, my ammunition before I shoot, then I might give you a little higher probability to recover more. Because that tells me that you actually paid attention to where they're going. Gotcha. Okay. So the recovery thing's more of a role play thing. And then if you recover something, then you just uncheck the box. There's one thing I forgot to have you guys do before we came over here, and I was going to have you guys grab potions. So. Go back to your um, inventory tab for a moment. And I want you to go to the items where you were searching for materials earlier. And the items is on the right hand side with a sword or a sword and an armor banner. Um, I want you to look for a healing potion, just a standard healing potion. I want you to drag that to your inventory. Just drag it to your inventory. And I want you to change it to two. So you can either drag the potion over twice or just edit the list. So Fantasy Grounds has a lot of really nice drag and drop features. Not everything is, but a lot of it is. So if you have a couple potions of healing, that's good. And you'll see why, why I had you do this later. So let's go back to the Actions tab. Okay, so we're going to code a weapon, and I'm going to say that each one of you has a magic weapon. And since both of you have crossbows, let's do that. Let's say it's a plus one crossbow. So what we're going to do is on the bottom right of your character sheet, we're going to click the Edit button. And you'll see a blue star and a blue sword appear. Let's click the sword. Okay. Now, do you see the, next to the dice there, it shows a sword? We need to change that to a bow. Okay. Where you have the crossbow that's already created, I want you to click the little magnifying glass next to it. It should be right next to that shield. And I want you to do the same thing for the new weapon that you're creating. I want you to pop up the properties window for that as well. And sometimes they'll double stack, so you'll have to move them out of the way. But I want you to have both weapon description next to each other where you're actually going to edit the properties of the weapon. So if you click the magnifying glass next to the crossbow and to the new entry that you just created, you should have two little square boxes that show the properties of the weapon. And it'll move around on you. I don't know why it does that, but when you click on the properties for each one, the other one wants to hide behind the other. So you might have to drag your character sheet out of the way. All right, so in the new one that you're going to create, you're going to put plus one crossbow comma light.
Now where it says attack down below, you're going to leave it at base. And for the bonus, you're going to put one in there. So you're getting a plus one to, t to attack. And now where it says damage, I want you to click on the edit button. And you're going to add the damage roll for it. In this case, it's a D8. So on the bottom left where your dice are, you're going to drag the eight-sided dice right up into the cell that says dice. So you're going to physically drag the dice up there, and that will add the damage type. And then where it says bonus, I want you to type one. And it also needs to say piercing. So where it says damage, that's the type of damage. So it's going to be piercing damage. That needs to be there, and it needs to be spelled correctly. If you don't spell it correctly, it will not parse correctly with Fantasy Crowns. It won't work. And then you need to say comma magic. Without the magic tag, that weapon is useless against creatures that are immune to normal weapons. You have demons and devils and some undead that are immune to standard weapons. So without that tag on there, all that, that plus one damage and plus one to hit isn't going to do anything. So that's how you make a magical weapon. So you may close those windows now. And next we're going to make a potion. So the edit button that had you click on earlier, please click on that again. But instead of clicking the sword, you're going to click the star. And it's going to make a new power. We're not really making a new power. That's just a default name for the group. So on the cell to the right, I want you to type consumables. So there's a cell or a blank white area. Type consumables in there. Okay. And where it says new spell or ability, I want you to type healing potion. Okay. Once you do that, um, that section will now turn to consumables. If you click on the uh, cell that you just edited, It should say healing potion on the left. So were you able to edit that, Berkey? Yes. Okay. It doesn't show on my side yet because it's a delay. Oh, okay. But it should say healing potion. Okay. The next thing you're going to do is... I want you guys to right click where it says consumables, not the header, but the actual white cell. You'll get a radial menu, in which case I want you to click on the arrow, which is add action. And you'll get another radial menu, and I want you to add the heal, which is the plus button. By the way, you guys are doing great. A lot of people get lost here. Okay, so on the bottom right, there is a very light colored magnifying glass. I want you to click that because that actually has the properties of the heel that we're going to code. Okay, and this is gonna be kind of similar to what we did with the weapon. But in this case, it's gonna be a healing function. So where it says heal, I want you to click the little edit button and hit the plus button. Okay. And a healing potion does 2d4 plus 2. So where it says bonus, um, type 2. And where your dice are, I want you to right click the four sided dice and select 2 and then drag those up to the dice cell. 
And the reason I had you do that, because I want you to realize that you can grab more than one dice at a time. So if you right click on those dice down there, the four sided in particular, the pyramid looking one, and you select two, you could drag those over and populate the dice field with those two dice instead of dragging one at a time. So if you're going to roll a percentile dice, if you look at the 10 sided, that's the one in the middle. There's a percentile there. You can, you can roll that. Or technically you can roll two of them and you'd have to decide which one was the first entry and which one was the second. Okay. So you guys can close that. You just coded your first potion. I got those numbers, the 2d4 plus 2 from the player's handbook. So that's where those numbers come from, is the actual player's handbook and the DM's guide. So when we do this, which is very cool, um, then we would need to adjust our inventory, right? Yes, and I'll show you how that works. You already have two in your inventory. Remember mm -hmm. I had you grab it? Now what's right. going to happen is we're, I'm going to show you how that works. So get out of the edit mode. So in other words, I don't want to see the star or the, the sword thing. I just want to see down below there's a mode called standard and a display called group. You see that down there on the very bottom left? Mm -hmm. If you don't see that, it's because you're still in the edit mode. Okay, I want you to change that to preparation where it says mode. Okay, so there's a couple things we're going to look at. Look all the way to the top where we had that weapon. Remember the plus one weapon that we had? You see how it has a bag next to it? That needs to show a shirt, which means it's equipped. So where your plus one light crossbow was that we made earlier, it should be reflected as a shirt. There's a little bag next to it. And same with anything else. If you have any other bags, those need to be changed to shirts, which changes the status of the item. So I see the regular crossbow is still, a, there you go. So that's something you need to check before you play. And this is kind of a preparation mode. Now where it says healing potion, we need to change that to two. So right next to the daily, it says zero. Let's change that to two. And where it says daily, we need to change that to once. So just keep clicking in that cell, and it changes it to once. Okay? Now what we're going to do is change the mode back to standard. And now you can see your usages right there. So this is a manual process. It won't keep track of it for you, but... When you go to use a potion, you just click one of those cells, and it'll keep track of that. When you use gotcha. when you use both of them, it'll actually end up disappearing from your character sheet, and I'll show you how that works. But before we do that, let's do your food. So let's take a look at your rations. How many rations do you have in your inventory? It's 10. I had to manually change it from 1 to 10 because when I added the pack, it was only 1. I double checked the pack description. That's okay. It's 10. Okay. Okay, let's go back to the um, action tab where we were. And we're going to make another consumable, and this is going to be your rations. Very similar to what we did with the potion. So click the edit button on the bottom right. Let's change the description to consumable. So copy and paste the description it used earlier or retype it in the new section. That way it'll put it in the correct category. So the cell to the right is the actual header or the category. The cell to the left is the description. Now in the description section, I want you to type rations or food or something like that.
So did you guys change it to food? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't show it on my side yet. Okay. Now get out of the edit mode again. And the reason I'm having you guys do this is so you get familiar with how this sheet works, because it can be kind of confusing. So make sure you're out of the edit mode, make sure you can see the mode, and change it to prep. And then change the quantity of your food. And then change it to once. And then change the mode back to standard. Okay, so there's your food consumption, there's your healing. Okay, that's how you keep track of it. Kind of in a, it's kind of a half-assed way to do it. There's really no other way to do it, but that's the way. So anything that you're going to consume would be pretty much taken like that. And this could be any other potions and things like that that you get in the game. So you basically set yourself up with a tracking system for some of your consumable items and you could put whatever you want in here i just gave you the two most common examples now when you get fantasy grounds and you buy all the books and stuff these potions do not come with the with the game in this format so you get the potions you drag them to your character sheet they don't always come with the properties as you can tell so you get the description and everything but you don't get the power itself, the healing function. And that's something you have to code yourself. Or there is a person that I know, rob 2 e He is a streamer, a community developer. He does a lot of the Fantasy Grounds conversions. He'll take like existing modules and convert them over for Smiteworks and for Wizards of the Coast stuff and also the DMs Guild. But then he also makes his own stuff. And what he's done is taken all these items and coded them for us. I mean, yeah, it costs a little bit. But in the future, if you guys invest in this stuff, I would recommend you doing that. Because then all you have to do at that point is drag it over. You don't have to mess around with all the, the coding stuff that we just did. However, I do want you to learn the coding. So we do offer classes here. They don't happen a lot, but they do happen. And when they do, I recommend you get in on them. So you can kind of understand this process a little bit more. Now, normally you don't have to mess with weapons, but I just wanted you to see how that works. Um, Pleshner, you have a quarter staff there. If you look at the uh, description, it's going to want you to, um, it, it says versatile, which means you can use that weapon one-handed or two-handed. So if you wanted to code that weapon for two-handed use, you would have to make another instance of the quarterstaff, change the damage, instead of 1d6, it would be a 1d8. And then the description of it, you'd be quarterstaff, parentheses, two-handed. So that way you could keep track of one-handed use or two-handed uses. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay. Should I do that right now? Sure. Um, Let's see if you can do it on your own. So just click uh, on the edit button on the bottom right. Um, look at the properties of the quarter staff. So you click the uh, magnifying glass and just copy those properties. The only difference is you're going to have an eight-sided dice instead of a six-sided. And then in the des description, you want to make sure that you know it's the two-handed usage of that weapon. Now there's a couple other variations of this like if you're a rogue and you have an offhanded attack that would be another situation where you might want to recode it because then in that case you wouldn't get your dexterity bonus or your strength bonus um, there's other versatile weapons the long sword the quarter staff the trident the war axe the where's there's a few others there's not that many oh the spear the spear is actually the most versatile because you can throw it. You can use it one-handedly or two-handed. And another thing, Pleshner, is when you go to your mode down below when you're done editing, you have to change it to where it's equipped instead of in the bag mode. So whenever you add something to your character sheet in that weapon section, you have to make sure it's equipped. And the, the cleaner way to actually do this 
is to make it in the item section and then drag it over. But for this tutorial, we're not going to get into all that. That's making your own items, and then, and that's usually not an option that you have as a player. As a DM, you can make stuff all day long. So if I was smart, I'd actually have all this stuff coded for you guys and just drag it over. But it mm -hmm. won't teach you anything if I do that. I actually uh, prepared the 200 quarter stuff. Uh, is everything correct? Yes. yes, very good. Good job. Okay. And now um, in the prep mode, so let's go get out of the edit mode if you're in there still, and let's go to back to preparation. Hey, Lauren, can I ask you a question real quick? Sure. Uh, feats. Uh, can I, when I get an ability for my character at like level four or whenever it is, can I forego that ability point and just pick up a feat? If you're a human variant, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So um, when you guys are getting ready to do your spells, this is the mode that I want you to be in. So in order to know how many spells you get, there's a chart in your class description. So the first thing I want you guys to do is go to your class um, shortcut that we had you made earlier, open that up, scroll down to about the middle of the list, and there's a table which will have your proficiency bonuses and your cantrips, and then it will also be another chart underneath that that tells you how many spell slots and how many spells per level. And I want you to have that available to you when you're selecting your spells. Another thing you have to look at is your features on your character sheet because quite often you'll get bonus spells and things like that. And this is when you get into the customization part that we're doing here. So if you look at bonus proficiency life on your um, cleric there, Berkey, it tells you that with this domain, you get at first level the proficiency to use heavy armor. Well, if you look at your proficiencies on your character sheet, it does not list heavy armor there. So you have to transfer that over to that line on the proficiencies. So where it says shields, you can put comma, heavy armor. And for Pleshner, it says you have an Eldritch Invocations. Let's see what that is. Yeah, it says at second level, you get two invocations of your choice, which are basically spells, and they're detailed at the end of the class description. So there's Eldritch Blast, Mage Armor, things like that. And then you also have an expended spell list for the Arch Fae, because you chose that as your patron. So when you're looking up your spells, you get extended spells in which you get to learn a couple extras. So on top of what they give you in the spell list, you also get any bonus stuff that's listed in your features on top of the normal stuff. So what I would do is keep that in mind when you're building your character, because for the Arch Fae, you get two extended um, spells automatically, and that's Fairy Fire, and sleep for first level, and you get calm emotions and phantasmal force. So those are also added to your spell list when you create your character. And kind of the same thing for you, Berkey, you have the life domain. If you click the life domain and you look at that, you get some bonus spells on top of what you already have for a list. So you get Bless and Cure Wounds. Those are bonus spells on top of what you already get from your class. So this is the fine details that you get into when you're creating your character. So just keep that in mind when you're building your character. And what I'm going to have you guys do is actually start picking your spells and then go back and grab those bonus ones. 
Okay. So let's go back to the action tab. And in the spells banner over to the right, you'll see spells. And up on top, there's a group. I want you to filter that group. And I want you to filter it to the 5E effects spell coding. So 5E spell effects coding. And then what I want you guys to do is on the bottom, I want you to change that level to zero because these are filters. And then I want you to change source to whatever class you are. So if you're warlock, change it to that. If you're a cleric, change it to that. Should I choose the cleric life domain? Yes, you can. It'll be oh. kind of limited, but I would pick from... It came up with zero. Exactly. <laughs> There's nothing there. Exactly. That's why I'm saying just go to Cleric. Because okay. we're doing your uh, cantrips right now. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. And then what you do is you look at your character sheet and you look at your maximum number of um, cantrips for, for your particular level. So you both are level three, so you should get those cantrips for level three. And you just pick a few of them that you want out of that out of that group. And cantrips can be cast every day, all day. They don't need any preparation, anything like that, or rest. Those are your go-to spells. Where do I find how many cantrips I get? In your class description. The, the, oh, gotcha. Okay, I got that pulled you, up. Yeah, if you scroll down. There's a couple charts there. The one you want to look at it has your proficiencies and your maximum per level. So make sure you're looking at level three and check the chart out. It says I get four first level and two second level. That spells. Oh, okay. Hold on. I'm I'm in the wrong place here then. Yeah, cantrip should be right above it. Oh, 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 I gotcha. Okay, mm -hmm. so I get three. Okay. Yep. So drag those over, the ones that look good to you, onto your character sheet. And remember, um, I would have at least one offensive, one defensive, and maybe one utility. It depends on how you play. But it's nice to have some extra spells and things that you can rely on every day. Because when you run out of your regular spells, these are the ones you go to. And I think um, in some cases when you're building your character, you'll get bonus spells because of the type of, of cleric or the type of, of warlock that you are. So like I was saying earlier, you have to look through those, those abilities areas and it'll tell you if you gain any additional spells or cantrips. But I think in this case, it's mostly just spells, but there are like, I think if you're a high elf, you get a bonus cantrip, things like that. So this is where you get down and dirty into all the little niggly stuff that's in your character. So Disciple of Life. Then you have Preserve Life. So there's a lot of little things to look at for your, for your character. And what's crazy is a lot of the stuff, like the spells you get from Wizards of the Coast, but you're like your class features and your racial features, most of those are not coded. So you you would be basically either forgetting that you had those abilities or your dungeon master and you would have to do it all manually. And I'll show you what I'm talking about in a little bit. And the spells that you're selecting from now, this 5e spell effects coding section, is the stuff that Rob 2E did. He's added the descriptions a little bit more thoroughly than the ones you get from Wizards of the Coast. So basically we're like your guidance spell, Berkey. It says T, which is touch, and C is concentration. And what happens there is 
you touch the person or yourself, and then you have to remain concentrated. Well, if you receive damage while you're concentrating on the spell, you have to make a concentration check in order to maintain the concentration. Well, in the old days, you just had to remember that. Well, nowadays, now that that's there, you know it's a concentration spell, and when you cast it on yourself, it will keep the concentration going, and then you'll actually cast the guidance on yourself or one of your allies. In which case, if you receive damage and you don't make the check, the the spell will will vanish. It will it'll expire. And Fantasy Grounds does that automatically now. So when you receive damage, it automatically roll that for you, if you have the concentration effect on you, and it will do it automatically. You don't have to remember that stuff. Nice. And then if you see a number in parentheses, that's the range. So he's put the range in there. Um, he's also put, like, if there's a dollar symbol, that means more than likely you have to buy a component to cast it. So some of them take, like, a pearl or some kind of diamond or something like that. And once you have that component, unless you lose it, it does not get consumed. Another thing that's cool is, like, he's put, like, you know, if it's... A bonus action so if it's a B next to it that means that you can cast that in addition to your normal turn there's all kinds of codings that he's put on these to make it easier for the player and the DM when you actually get it out of the standard players handbook it doesn't have all that on there you either have to do it yourself or you have to look up each description of the spell before you use it So once you're done with your cantrips, um, I want you to filter on the bottom to level one. And I think both of you get bonus spells. So look at your list on your character class description. Find out how many spells you get drag those over and there's a total number of spells that doesn't mean you get per level so if you look at the total level of spells you need to split those between first and second level and they could be in any order you want but you cannot exceed the total number of spells Where did I see which ones I already get? I don't remember where that was. Okay, in your abilities tab. Oh, oh, right, 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 right. Okay, gotcha. And I think it was Life Domain or one of those where it actually shows the bonus spells. Yeah. So yeah. you get those yeah. automatically on top of what they already give you. So that I would be in addition to, not instead of. But you're just trying not to pick the same spells twice. I get that. And that's also true of Pleasure. Um He gets a couple Arch Face spells per level. So whatever those are in your in your list, Pleasure, you get to drag those over automatically. Aren't they just added to the spell list? So I can select them, but I have access to them, but I have to select them as part of their other spells. Or are you getting them for free? Yes. For free, yes? Yes. Those are additional spells that are granted to you from your otherworldly patron. So as being a member of the Arch Fey, those are your bonus spells. And same with the Life Domain. You're getting those bonus spells because you're, you are worshipping a deity that is granting you those spells. So... Warlocks are very parallel to, to priests in that regard. 
they're getting spells granted to them from a higher power. The only thing about Warlocks is they don't get as many spells, but when the spells they get are pretty cool. And you guys can collapse your menu or your spells after you drag them over. If you click on the magnifying glass that's lit up, it's kind of bright. That will collapse your list so it'll make give you more room. You guys see what I'm talking about? That made it a lot better. Yeah, yeah it cleans nicer. it up so it's cleaner. There's a few other sections that we're going to build that's like this, and we're almost done. So probably about another 30 minutes, and we'll be complete. I don't remember what time we started. Was it 11, 10? It was 10.30. It was like... Yes, yes. So about two hours is about right to make. Spellcasters take a little bit longer. If you were both like first level fighters, we'd already be done. Me take weapon, me smash. Okay, let me know when you guys are done with your spells and your bonus spells. I'm done. Can I join in or is this... What's that? Can I go join in or are, have y'all been doing... Like, are y'all almost over? Yeah, we're almost over. So Sonic, you're welcome to mute your mic and just listen in. If you have any questions, you can either type it in the stream or in the uh, chat um, area for Classroom 2, okay? All right. Cool. Thank you. All right, guys. You good? You done with your spells, Plishner? Yes, yes. Okay, so if you're in prep mode... What you'll do is you will change your the, the spells that you're going to have memorized for the day. So go ahead and click that. You can technically click all of them, but the thing is is that when you're preparing those spells, you cannot normally have more prepared than, than your, your level plus your proficiency bonus. So keep that in mind too. So in your guys' case, your third level, plus you have the proficiency bonus of two. So I believe that's the case where you can't prepare more than that formula. But you can select the spells to cast for the day or for the amount of your slots. And you can switch the spells as a life domain cleric. You just have to arrange that with your dungeon master and just swap spells out. Okay. From the list that you have. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go into prep mode and you click the little circle next to the spells that you have prepared for the day. And if you look on top, it tells you your spell slots or your pack magic, whatever you have. Spell slots, pack magic, kind of the same thing. Okay, now let's change the mode back to standard. Um, one second, uh, I'm looking right now into Eldritch Invocation. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, um, 
uh, have some rules and it's like modifying the spells and you know, like when you cast out a blast add your charisma modifier to the damage it deals on a hit right so yep so let's look at the properties of the elders blast so if you click on the little magnifying glass next to it it shows how it's um, built up. Yes, and I added in charisma there into damage. Yep. There you go. Now you kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about, right? Like, all these spells do not come with this type of stuff in it when you buy it from uh, Wizards of the Coast or Smiteworks. You kind of have to get to know what they do, and like you just said, you pointed out that you get your charisma bonus added to it. Okay, so let's change the mode back to standard. Once you're done picking your spells. Okay. And I want you to change the mode to um, combat now. And then the group, I want it to say actions. So combat and then display group should say actions. Yep. Now that's how it should look when you're playing. Okay. So like, for instance, if you just see a guy, or like a little dude there, that symbol is just an effect that you apply either to yourself or to somebody else. If it's a dice roll, that means you have to roll first against a target, and then you can apply the effect. If it's a drop which is damage you would do the roll or you would just apply the damage so there's a series of things you have to do depending on the type of spell it is some spells are automatic some are not and if it has a roll associated with it in effect what you're doing is you're rolling the saving throw for the monster for the DM and if the monster fails then you apply the damage and either it doesn't do anything at all or it does half damage if they save and then if that works, then you will, if there's a secondary effect or something like that, then you would apply that also. And so that's what all those buttons are next to your, your, your skills and your, um, excuse me, your spells. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're done with spells for the most part. Let's go back to the spells section in the interface on the right-hand side. And this time... Um, for, I believe, I don't remember who is the non-human, Plishner? Correct. Okay, I want you to go to the 5E race traits effects coding. Um, Berkey, you don't have to do this because you're not, you're just human. You don't have any racial traits. Okay. If you did, that's where you would go. And then, um, Plishner, look for... Oh, make sure you, un both of you, unfilter the stuff that you looked at earlier for spells. So get rid of Warlock and the levels on the bottom of the spell search area. Yeah, if you don't get rid of those filters, a lot of the stuff won't show up. So Placioner, I want you to make a category on your action tab before you drag it over. This is a cleaner way to do this. So on the bottom right of your actions tab, Plishner, I want you to click on the edit button, make a new power, which is a star. I want you to the right hand side, I want you to call this racial abilities. 
because that's going to be your new group. And for it says new spell or ability, don't worry about that. We just need to make the category. Okay, now you have a new header. So any racial skills that you get from being a half-elf will be dragged right into that section. So like Fey Ancestry, for instance. you have any others, or is that it? Okay, there you go. Yes, that's the one we want. Yep. Okay. Now, same thing. I want you both to filter out on the top in the groups. I want you to go to 5E Class Features Effects Coding. So up on top, where it says Group, look for 5E Class Features Effects Coding and select that filter. Okay, Plushner, I want you to make a new section, and this time I want you to call it Standard Actions. So your group name will be called Standard Actions. Same thing with you, um, Berkey. Click the Edit button. Um, click the star for a new power. And then in, to the right-hand side of that, I want you to call this Standard Actions for the group. So on the right-hand side, that's where you set your category. And what I want you guys both to do is very carefully drag all those action features from the top of the list into the standard action section. And you might have to kind of stretch your screen out because if you notice, you're getting a lot of different stuff there. So all those actions there are things that you can perform during a combat round. It makes that a lot simpler when you're playing if you have all those on your character sheet already. That way you don't have to do it manually. This is something that Rob's included because he gets very frustrated when you have to stop the game and figure all that stuff out. All right, so go ahead and collapse that menu or the section that you just made. Okay, and last but not least, we're going to look up your actual class features that come with your build. So for the cleric, you want to scroll through that list until you find cleric. It's probably on page one or two. For the warlock, it's probably on the last page five or four. And what you want to do is look at your class features on the abilities tab and drag over any of those features that belong to your particular build for your character. So for instance, for Berkey, you guys want to make a new section, both of you, before you drag anything over and call it class features. So you do the edit again, create new power. You're just creating a new group, basically. To the right-hand side, call it um, class features or class abilities, however you want to say it. And then anything that you knew that you're going to drag over will be dropped right into that section. You need to pull it, drag it over, make sure it goes in there. Otherwise, it'll default to spells. And then you have to change the description or the category. So in the 5e spell features effects coding area, I want you to find your class. It should be cleric and warlock. And uh, Berkey, where I know this stuff is, is in your um, class abilities. If you look at those, and it talks about uh, your class features that are for your healing and for your domain, you actually get a couple um, different features for being the life domain. Okay. I'll check that. So just for instance, like you get Channel Divinity, Preserve Life. So you drag that over onto your section that you just created, your class features. And I got that information from your class features ability section. 
and you get one other if you look down you get turn undead so go ahead and grab that and pull that over but I do want you to look at your character and say oh okay that's where that came from and this is the types of things that you guys have to know based on the type of cleric or the type of warlock that you're creating And again, these features do not come automatically with your characters when you're buying or when you're buying the standard rules. It tells you you get these abilities, but in the old way they used to do it is you just to drag the ability from your abilities tab into the chat window, and then you would, the DM would click on it and it gives him all the rules, and then he'd have to do all the rules manually. That's how this used to play. Now, homie, don't play that no more. All right. So, Pleshner, are you finding your uh, anything for your class? I found one of the abilities, but uh, I cannot find uh, like Pacts, uh, Pact of the Tomb, for example, which uh, also allows me to learn uh, three additional cantrips of any kind. Okay, well, that would be you would add those to your cantrips. That's really no, not no, codable. No. Uh, well, uh, it's I can cast them only while I have uh, that tome. Correct. And if I don't have, I have to go through ceremony and how right. to do all of that. Yeah. So, what pack did you take, Archfey? Uh, um, Master Ashfei and Pact, Pact of the Tomb. I just said three cantrips, correct? Yep. So this is the stuff that takes the longest because it's all the customization part. Imagine if you had to do all these yourself. I mean, minus the spells, those are kind of half there. But as far as the uh, all the special abilities and stuff, that, that takes a long time. So you guys' characters are pretty much done. I mean, this is the, the bulk of it. Uh, what I recommend you do is um, on your in the chat window to save your character to your to your computer, you would type the right slash and then type the word save and hit enter and it will save your character on your on your computer. Now, it, being that you guys have a, a regular license and that, you'll have you'll be able to access the characters much easier once we're done. And I'm going to tell you how to manage your character after we're done here. And when you're done editing your character, um, change the mode to combat and the display group to actions. And that, that'll be a, a done deal. Yep, and that's what your character will look like when you're ready to play. You guys just have to get used to those different modes. They're for different reasons. Like when you're setting up powers, you want that display group to be standard and group. When you're preparing spells and consumables and all that stuff, you want it to say display group preparation and display actions, or, or it can say group. And when you're ready to fight and play, it's combat and actions. This is how you want your sheet. So go ahead and do the right slash, type save, hit enter. You should get the, the confirmation on your side.
So besides managing your characters, is there any questions so far? No. This no, everything's clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that stuff that we did for this last half an hour is all customized work. So I advise you guys to get this stuff later when you get more into the game itself. This will help you when you build characters and all kinds of things. Rob Tui has also just recently released all the magic items, all the potions. He's, he's done that this year, and he's done it in a record amount of time. It's only taken him less than a month to do it, which is really wow. incredible. I mean, there's I thousands. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll just serve thousands of items. Not all of them need to be coded, but a good number of them do. I was over on the um, DM scale. DM. Yeah, and I looked at his stuff, and it, it, it looks really cool. It is, and it's, you know, it's necessary. It's not like, you know, it's an extra thing. It's actually necessary. I don't, I, I, I don't, I can't think of any why I would even play without that stuff. Unless I felt like wasting a bunch of time and trying to figure all that stuff out while I'm running a game. Um, it, you know, it kind of defeats the purpose of the automation if you don't have all this stuff coded. All right, not everything can be coded, but most stuff can. So now what we're going to do is to get out of a game properly or out of, off of a table, you're going to right click on the leather background and you'll see an X and I want you to click the arrow, which, which is exit to launcher. This is the clean way to get out of a game. When you exit, you don't want to always exit out. If you're not editing anything or not creating anything, you can just hit the X and go out. Okay, I still got you guys here? Yep. Yes. Okay, so what I would like you guys to do is wait for it to go back to the launch screen. And I'm going to show you how to manage your characters. And once you've done this, you pretty much know how to, how to deal with characters. It usually takes it a few minutes because it's actually saving. So one word of advice, when, you're, when your computer's taking a few minutes, be patient with it, let it, let it think, let it do its thing. If you don't, you might corrupt your save. And if you did a lot of work, that would not be good. There is a way to recover, but you'll lose all your work for the day. When you guys are both to the launch screen, let me know. I'm there. Okay, Fleshner? I also am okay. at the rollout. All right, so what we're going to do now is go to Manage Characters. And you'll see the session uh, CC101 that we were part of just a minute ago. You click that and hit Start or Launch or whatever. It, it'll take you to the management section of Fantasy Grounds. And so all we're doing is we're changing the status of the character at this point. So right now, it's saved on your computer, but it has the tag as a server character in which you would be using that at someone else's table. But what we're going to do is export it, and then when you re-import it into your own campaign, it changes it to a local character. So if you were to just load up your, your, your campaign that you have going on, you wouldn't see the character because it, it's not exported yet. So you go into that screen there and you click on PC. Um, there's a setup window. You don't need that. And you should see your character there. And it should say server character as a tag on it. Has it loaded yet for you guys? I'm still loading. Okay. It takes a few minutes. It's pretty slow. They are going to release a new um, version of Fantasy Grounds next year or, some, or later this year. And I guess all your stuff that you've purchased will still be compatible and usable. So I guess that's, that's good. <laughs> and they're going to... Okay. Okay. All right. Once you guys are in there, you can close that campaign setup window. It's kind of annoying, but that's just a default. And then what they want you to do is well, have you click the PC area where you select your PCs. 
and you should see your character that you just made on my table. Mm -hmm. Now, it'll have all the stuff, that, or most of the work that you did. The only difference is you won't have the portrait. And anything that may have been linked to the player's handbook or anything, if you don't own that book, when you load it into your side of the, the table, it may not link properly. But since you guys have already kind of, you know, it'll, it'll be okay. But whatever you have up to now will be okay. You just won't be able to add new spells and things if you don't own the book. Another thing is all your notes and your background information, you can edit that, and, it, and that won't be a problem. Okay, so the next thing I want you guys to do is click the edit button there, and you'll see a blue arrow appear on your actual character in that list. That is the export button. And it'll want you to save it somewhere on your hard drive, so make sure you know where that is. And then name the character cleric level three or whatever you want to call it and it will export a small xml file okay got it okay <clears throat> Okay, once it's saved, it's pretty much golden. Um, basically, you can do two things with that, or three things with that character. You can go to a website, upload it, and print it as a PDF. So if you want to use it for a tabletop, you can. You can import it in your game. So when you load up your, your campaign, um, all you have to do instead of making a new character is just click the... Uh, edit button and it will create an import dialog in which you can import that character and you'll be able to see it or you can send it to your dungeon master so those are your three options very cool so Berkey if you haven't already created your own campaign you just create a new campaign go in and make sure it's fifth edition of course Go in and just go ahead and say, hey, you know, we're going to uh, uh, look at this character, load it up. So instead of clicking the plus button to make a new character, you would click the other blue button and it would import it into that game or into that campaign. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yep. And there is a website where you guys can print these things if you want. So you can look at them later if you're not on your computer. And in... Yeah. In our Discord channel, we have a resources area. So if you click back on our Fantasy Grounds College and you scroll up where it says resources, and if you look at the links down below, there's a thing that says, or a, a heading or a listing that says, print your PC from an exported Fantasy Grounds character into PDF. So this is in the resource area. There's a bunch of different uh, lists there. And then Rob2E's effects coding package link is there. There's a YouTube video that helps you learn how to use the effects codings. There's also a folder, a shared Google Drive, that I have shared with the public so that you guys can look at this stuff and start figuring out how the 5th edition rules work. And those are little guides and shortcuts and extensions and things that you can use to help you along with 5th edition stuff. And last but not least, I would like you guys to consider filling out that survey if you haven't already. There's a survey link. It's called General Feedback Survey. It's in the resources area. And what we do with that is I just build classes based on the input that you guys put in there. You can be as honest as you want. I don't care if you say anything mean. I would rather it be honest than, than not. And we do have a Patreon website for donations. We have Twitter. We have Facebook, YouTube. We have this new Twitch channel, which I need to add here. Um, any type you need resources or 
even like all the acronyms and the and the uh, slang that we use here. There's a common terms and abbreviations. So if you don't know what all that stuff is, you can look that up. That has the acronyms. This may also be helpful. Like if you're from another country and you're not sure what all that stuff is, that's the dictionary for the for the terminology. So any other questions? Mm -mm. No, this is great. No, Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So I'd like you guys to Good have lesson. fun and, uh, you know, spread the word and come back here if you want more lessons. The, the next one you guys want to get into is probably the coding effects class and also the, uh, what you call it, the uh, combat and exploration class. Because that gets into actually showing you how to use your character in play. It's a lot funner, actually. Okay. That's a lot closer to playing than this is. So this right. is a lot more collegiate than the others. All right. Well, it's nice to meet you guys. Um, hopefully you had a good time. And, you know, it took a couple hours, maybe almost two and a half hours. But that's roughly the average time. So. All right. Thank you very much. This was great. Okay, guys. Thank Take you. care. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.